G'day, my name is Brendan, and my dream is to turn computer performance analysis into a science, one where we can completely understand the performance of everything, of applications, of libraries, of kernels, of hypervisors, of firmware, and of hardware. Now, to do this, I need to be able to look inside everything, to look inside software and hardware. There is a new technology in Linux that's letting me do this in production at Netflix. It's BPF. I've previously described this as an observability superpower. And I'll begin with a demonstration so that you can see. This is turning the Wi-Fi signal strength from my laptop into audio. And I have my laptop tethered to this phone. The closer I get, the higher the pitch. Some people have described this as a BPF theremin. Although I'm getting some interference. You can see this. That's really high. And if I go away, it will drop. Another demonstration I can do, although if I try now, I'll fall off the stage, is if I connect my laptop to the conference Wi-Fi, I can then walk around my laptop and use my body to interfere with the signal to the laptop. And by positioning myself, I can detect where the conference Wi-Fi routers are. If I try this, I'll fall off the stage. Now, I'll show you how this works. I'm using BPF to instrument the wireless driver on my laptop. The wireless driver is Intel wireless driver, IWL. And I don't really know anything about it. This is a good example because it's something that you may find when you have access to this superpower, is what do you do with it? How do I approach a new system and do black box analysis? One thing I like to start with is frequency counting, the functions that are firing in the target software. So I'm using a tool I wrote called FunkCount to do this. I don't know what the functions are called in the IWL driver, so I'm just matching everything containing IWL. And while tracing, I found that the most frequent function was something called underscore underscore IWL debug, DBG. And there's some other ones here as well. Now, my goal is to find where the wireless driver is detecting signal strength. And I can take this list of functions that are actually firing, and I can go through the open source software of IWL. This is an advantage you may not have thought about of open source software. It's that we can attach traces to it and come up with custom observability tools much more easily, because I can read the source code to all of these to figure out what they actually do. In fact, when I wrote this demonstration, I didn't get very far. I started with the most frequent one, frequent one, IWL debug, and looked at the source code, which is in Linux, it's open source, and found that this appeared to be an Intel debug printf for doing debug information on what the driver is up to. And in fact, I can see, if I count the arguments, arg like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, Arg4 is the format string for printf, and it's followed by the variable arguments, if you know the syntax of printf. OK, so now I can use dynamic instrumentation. And I'm now going to switch to a higher level BPF-based tool, BPF trace. And I'll instrument IWL debug. And I'm just going to print out that format string to see what it contains. And there's all this stuff. 
enabling interrupts, ICT index, value, whatever that is. You can't see the values because I'm just printing out the format string, the values of the, the other arguments, which I can fetch as well if I want to. Pending allocation requests. Got more pending allocation requests. I'm surprised that there's so much stuff. I'm not running the IWL driver in any special debug mode. This is a stock standard Ubuntu laptop, and yet it's saying all this stuff and no one's listening to it. This is basically going to dev null. Reduce TX power, test window. And there's some, if you browse this for long enough, you find some very strange messages. No data about high rate and low rate is worse. Increase rate. <laughs> BA notification received. And is it really going to do printfs on all the interrupts? Because I have an idea on how to increase performance. And that's don't do printfs on every interrupt. That's going to slow you down a little bit. But you know what? As a performance engineer, this is such a wealth of information, I kind of don't want Intel engineers to turn it off. So if you work at Intel, you can just leave this on. Maybe give me a mode to turn it off when I want high performance. Because I can mine this for all sorts of interesting stuff. Energy in, A, B, C. So it, as it turns out, I went through this, went through some of the messages, and I quickly found one of these did do the signal strength. And so I was able to do a BPF trace one liner that looks like this. I'm instrumenting IWL debug. If it's this particular string, I know the signal strength is in arg5. And so then I'm just printing it out as a number. It's much more fun to print it out as the ASCII representation and to turn it into audio as well. But this is a demonstration of going up to some software some open source software that I do not have prior expertise with and creating my own custom observability tool. And I can do this in production. And that's why I've called this a superpower. I'm going to talk about how BPF is changing Linux, explain what BPF is properly, and then show observability tools as a use case. For 50 years, we've had one dominant model for operating systems. Applications run in user mode. They access resources through system calls into the kernel. This comes from Multics in the 1960s. And Multics had multiple rings of security. We still see evidence of this in processors. That's why you have ring 0, 1, 2, and 3, although we often only use two of those rings, or maybe a third for hypervisors. This model hasn't changed for decades. We still have applications and system calls and the kernel. There has been work on different models. So you may have heard of unikernels and microkernels. There's been many academic papers on these. There's been projects for these, and they're on GitHub. There's been proof of concepts. But what these projects lack is adoption. What they really need is that use case where Netflix has run an entire microservice as unikernels, or Facebook, or Google, or anyone. BPF has changed the model and introduced a new API into the kernel and a new type of applications, kernel mode applications. And this has had adoption because it's part of the Linux kernel. And we're using it at Netflix, and we're using it at Facebook and other companies. This is a new API, and this is going to mean a change to how we learn operating systems. Apart from providing a new API into the kernel, BPF is, has also provided its own model for running programs. For 50 years, we have basically had the same process state model for writing applications. I've drawn a generic version of it here. Linux groups many of these together as the same sleep state. 
Your application is running in user mode. You call into the kernel for resources, and then from the kernel, you may block on resource IO a locks sleeping or waiting for work. You may get descheduled because there's a lot of CPU load. This is a time-sharing system. BPF programs use a new program state model. BPF programs begin with an event that fires, and that program runs to completion. It does not block. It does not go to sleep. There, there are spin locks in BPF, although we haven't really used them much. So this is a much more simple event-based model. It's a non-blocking model. At the moment, we're writing a lot of BPF programs in C and also in BCC and BPF trace, which I'll explain in a moment. But I think over time, for complicated applications, given that this is a non-blocking model, we will see people use non-blocking languages. And there's been many examples. So Node.js has syntax and libraries that are designed to be non-blocking. And we should see new languages for BPF applications that are similar, non-blocking. How did we get here? Last year, I was at a special invite-only conference called NetConf in Boston. This is where the Linux kernel network engineers meet once a year to decide what is going to change in Linux networking for the next year and to make decisions. At the time, I was writing observability tools, and I was there to talk about that. And sometimes, I ran into a kernel limit, the BPF instruction limit, which is four kilobytes. And if I ran into it, I would figure a workaround. I would change the byte code, the instructions I was doing. It wasn't really a big problem for me. Alexei Storytonov, who's the original creator of eBPF, gave a talk at NetConf and had a bold idea. He wanted to change the instruction limit from four kilobytes to one million instructions. <laughs> one million instructions? I barely hit four kilobytes. Why do I need one million instructions? Alexei was thinking far ahead. And to explain it, he said he wanted the limit to be so large that you could write a Rubik's Cube solver in pure BPF. In fact, Alexei does not like me talking about the instruction limit being one million because he said if people run into that, he's going to increase it to two million and keep increasing it so that BPF can run any application. It should not have these artificial limits. And this year, at Kernel Recipes in Paris, Alexei revealed another astonishing number. Now that the limits have been increased and BPF is seeing adoption, on every server at Facebook, they are running 40 BPF programs by default. And at peaks, they're reaching 100. This is a real thing. This is running, this has had the adoption that models like unikernels and microkernels have not seen. It's being run by Facebook. It's being run by Cloudflare for doing DDoS mitigation. And at Netflix, we're rolling out BPF programs as well, and so are many other companies. I work at Netflix. We have over 150,000 Amazon EC2 server instances. It's a great place to work. And we have over 14 active BPF programs on our, in our base AMI. We're now at 15 because we just added one for doing flow accounting so that we can log whenever a service connects to another service. And then visualize that and look at the logs. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. So to explain BPF, BPF a bit more, it's allowing new event-based applications that run in kernel mode. These events may be triggered from user mode applications. And so you may have an application that has some parts in user space and other parts in kernel space where that makes sense. These kernel mode applications can also get triggered from kernel events and hardware events as well. 
Another way to understand this is some people have already said that BPF is allowing the Linux kernel to become microkernel-ish. And that's already been said by many other people, Jonathan Corbett, Thomas Graff, Greg Cora Hartman. Microkernel-ish. So the idea of microkernels is you have a simple, thin kernel, and then you implement the TCP IP stack in user space, the scheduler in user space, and other kernel components in user space. That gives you more flexibility for customizing things, swapping out kernel components. In BPF, this is allowing us to do something similar. BPF programs are defined by users. So they are user-defined programs. And they can get loaded into the kernel and hook into the components necessary so they can be a scheduler or whatever algorithms we want. There's already ways for BPF to do TCP congestion control algorithms, to do firewalls, to do observability tools, which is what I'm doing. And we'll see that grow and grow. The infrared device driver is using BPF, and there's been talk of other drivers using BPF as well. Greg Cora Hartman at Kernel Recipes talked about how he wanted to explore USB drivers as BPF programs. And there's, there are various advantages to doing this, which I'll explain once I get into BPF internals. So what is BPF? Where does it come from? It stands for Berkeley Packet Filter, or it originally did. BPF was this technology to make TCP dump code faster. TCP dump will capture packets and allows you to type a filter expression, like host is 127.001 and port 80. Doing packet capture can be a CPU expensive operation because packets can be very frequent. I can do millions of packets a second, especially at Netflix because we're at over 33% of the US internet traffic at night. So anything involving packet capture has me a little bit worried as a performance engineer because I know overheads matter a lot. But for the TCP dump filter expressions, this was greatly improved many years ago with BPF. And what BPF did was take your filter expression and then compile it into this BPF bytecode, this virtual bytecode, which is the most efficient way to match your filter. That bytecode is then loaded up into the kernel, and then the kernel will turn it into the native instructions for that current architecture, and then run that efficiently. The technology to do that is a virtual machine. And this is a really obscure virtual machine. I mean, I, I wouldn't have guessed I'd be giving talks about BPF. It is such an arcane and narrow component of the kernel. But because we've been extending it and we're using that virtual machine for other things, BPF has grown into its own ecosystem. When I use the words virtual machine, I mean like the Java JVM and not a virtual machine in the VMware sense. So BPF programs, once they are run in the kernel virtual machine, they get turned into native instructions, and they're running efficiently on metal. There's no layer that's interpreting anything. Nowadays, BPF is extended BPF. That's what Alexei and Daniel Borkman and others have been working on for the past five years in Linux. And as I said, it's its own ecosystem now. We have front ends for tracing, like BPF Trace, BCC for doing networking as well. We have conferences. I have a book coming out. It's just come out as an e-book, and it's coming out in paper this month, an 880-page book on BPF performance tools. There's companies that are creating BPF software to sell. Cilium is one company by Isovalent. It is container networking security. Facebook has a Catran project for intelligent load balancing. Google has KRSI for doing security with eBPF. Netflix has Flows R Us, which we're including in base AMI. And there's many more. eBPF, BPF nowadays, 
And I sometimes call it eBPF because that's what we did to start with, eBPF being extended BPF. It is a kernel execution engine, a way of defining programs in user space and then getting the kernel to run them. These programs can be many things. Intrusion detection, container security, observability, firewalls, device drivers. There's already BPF, a BPF firewall in Linux, BPF filter that is likely to become the standard. The work originally for BPF, the extensions to BPF, was the first use case I've got, software-defined networking. And that was at a company called Plum Grid, where Alexi originally was. And they were extending BPF so that you could define firewalls and NAT and routing in the kernel, rather than it just being that TCP dump filter expression technology. An inflection point was when Alexi visited Netflix in 2014, and I talked to him about other use cases, observability tools. And we made an agreement. If Alexi connected it to other event sources, K probes and U probes and trace points, I would write the observability tools to do it. And Alexi and others were successful in getting those patches merged. And that's how BPF has gone from being just a networking technology to being a generic application environment, because we can connect to any event source. When programs go into the kernel, they will go through a verifier, which checks for security. BPF itself is open source. It's in the Linux kernel. And that means if you're on Linux, you're getting it. There's already work to explore bringing it to other kernels as well, like BSD from where BPF originated. BPF is also now a technology name and not really an acronym. We know it's, it originally stood for Berkeley Packet Filter, but the BPF ecosystem nowadays does not have much to do with Berkeley or packets or filtering, since it's doing so many things. Yes, this name was come up by engineers. If we had a marketing department, I'm sure they would have come up with a much better name. We originally were calling it extended BPF, or eBPF for short, but Alexi now wants to keep it as just BPF, as we've extended BPF. He also likes the three-letter acronym because BPF is a bytecode, an instruction set, similar to x86 and ARM, um, and the convention there is three-letter acronyms. The internals of BPF, So I mentioned the verifier. The verifier ensures that the program is secure and is not doing anything it shouldn't. It can then go through an interpreter or a JIT compiler, which will turn it into the machine code for execution, the native instructions. One of the important parts of extended BPF is map storage. That's a, it's like an associative or an array, which can be tens or hundreds of megabytes large, if need be, for supporting complicated programs. And that can be accessed from user space as well as kernel space. Some distributions turn off the interpreter. And so the only way to run BPF code is the JIT compiler. And there's a really interesting reason for that. Earlier, we saw the meltdown inspector vulnerabilities. These were. These included the biggest performance impacts I've seen in my career. They could potentially slow down, but they could slow down micro benchmarks by up to 800%. For production workloads at Netflix, it was much smaller. My, my anticipation was less, around 1% or less once we turn things on, fortunately. But Spectrum Meltdown, the mitigations required changing applications, so recompiling things with Brett Pauline. It involved kernel changes, the KRSI patches. It involved hypervisor changes. And it also involved bare metal changes, CPU microcode. So it changed the entire software stack. But there was one program that it didn't need to change. And that was BPF bytecode. And the reason was we changed the JIT compiler to take the BPF bytecode and then emit instructions that were meltdown inspector safe. And by that way, those programs automatically 
had the mitigation included. This is a very neat use of the JIT compiler. And that's the reason that some distributions have decided to disable the interpreter, because they want all BPF programs to go through the JIT compiler, so they, they are automatically patched with the latest security mitigations. Now, I've talked about BPF as an, as an instruction set, as a byte code, and Alexi is making it so, the, the limit's so large we can write complicated applications. A topic that has come up a number of times is, is BPF Turing complete? And a test for that would be, can I write BPF in BPF? Can I write arbitrary programs in BPF? Now, we've discussed this at length, and it turns out the bytecode, the instruction set, can be, that can be Turing complete, but the verifier prevents it. The verifier blocks unbounded loops. So there, there are bounded loops that were added in Linux 5.2, so that you can run a loop with a maximum number of iterations, but we can't run almost infinite loops, just in case you're curious. Another way to understand BPF, I've drawn this table where, I've, where I have columns as factors, and I'm showing the difference between user mode applications, kernel mode software, and BPF programs. And to go through these, the execution model for BPF is event-based. These programs are run on events that you attach to. It may be a software function, a hardware event, a timed interrupt. BPF programs are user-defined, which makes it more flexible. People don't need to change and recompile the kernel. They can be compiled as JIT compiled, and I mentioned the advantages of that earlier. There is a project at Facebook where they're coming up with core, which is compile once, run everywhere. And a result of that would be to have a BPF program, the bytecode, stored inside an ELF binary as a section, and then to have the metadata necessary to take that binary and run it on other machines. That's really, that's going to be really cool because it will mean that BPF programs can be compiled once and then packaged up. So you can apt get install some product and it comes with pre-compiled BPF programs that can work even on different kernel versions. A big part of this was finishing this metadata that's part of the kernel called BTF, BPF type format, so that the programs knew what the type of structures and their makeup, so that this was all possible. Security, BPF is verified, and it's also JIT compiled. And security is, it's an important feature. If you came to Netflix and you said, I've written this awesome application, I need you to run it in production. It's a kernel module, or it runs as root. I might hesitate. And I know if you run kernel modules and you make a mistake, you could panic the system. You could introduce a security vulnerability. And you may be doing this because you want to write some observability agent or some device driver. If you came to Netflix instead and said, here's this special agent you can run. It's a BPF program. That's different. Now I know I have assurances of security. It will go through the verify. It will be JIT compiled. And so this will enable applications and companies to exist that had a much more difficult proposition before, trying to convince companies to run kernel modules so that they could do their thing. Well, now it can be BPF programs, much safer. The failure mode for BPF programs when things go wrong should be an error message rather than panicking the system or aborting and doing a core dump. And the final column, I show the difference for resource access. In user mode applications, you must syscall into the kernel or trap into the kernel to access resources, and that comes with a cost of doing either context switches or mode switches. The kernel itself has direct access to hardware, that's the kernel's job, BPF programs are running kernel mode, so they're much, more, they're much closer to hardware. You don't have full direct access, but performance is much better, and that's shown by benchmarks. 
There's also ways for BPF to be offloaded to network cards. And so there is special hardware that's now being added to cards for running BPF programs. And so that's, that's going to be even better than kernel access, because now it's offloaded to the card itself. Now, as a use case of BPF, I'm going to go through performance analysis tools. But this is only one of many use cases of BPF. BPF enables a new class of custom, efficient, and production-safe performance analysis tools. I've written many. On this diagram, I've decorated it with black for the BPF tools that previously existed, many of which I wrote. But I also wrote many more for the BPF Performance Tools book, which was just released. And so I've got those in red. All of these tools are open source. We install all of these tools in the Netflix base AMI so that people can run them if needed. This diagram I have printed out on my wall because I, I can't remember all of these tools, even though I wrote many of them. I can look at an area. If I'm having a block device issue, I can use this as a reminder and a checklist. Have I tried BioTop and BioSnoop and BioLatency? And then work through those tools. I'm going to go through some examples so that you can see how BPF is an observability superpower and can see everything. In these examples, if it ends in a .py, it comes from an open source project called BCC. That's the BPF compiler collection. If it ends in .bt, it comes from a different open source project, BPF Trace. Some of these tools have been implemented for both. And I'll go through the differences between these open source projects after we've seen these tools. The first is execsnoop. I've written this for different operating systems, and it's very popular. So this is really my latest versions of execsnoop. This particular output I'm showing happened for, for a, at Netflix I was doing micro benchmarking on an instance, and the results showed higher latency, 99th latency than I was expecting. And when I ran exec snoop, I saw this stuff happening on my instance. Now this is supposed to be an idle instance that I am micro benchmarking to find out how fast it is. But every second, there was this wave of processes that was running. Bash, service stat, Netflix, HTTPD, Perl, PS, grep, sed, exargs. What's going on? What is all this stuff? So what happens at Netflix is if you deploy an instance and don't configure an application, there is a start script that continuously tries to start the non-existent application. And so that was perturbing my benchmark. It was it's difficult to see this from other tools. Like if you run top, top takes snapshots of what's in proc and shows you the top CPU consumers. But these are short-lived. So these don't last long enough to show up in top. That's why there's another version of top called ATOP that uses a different mechanism to show you really what's going on. But exec, the exec step was great. It showed me the list. It's like, ah, oh, I need to turn all that stuff off. And so then my benchmarks were much better. So I got rid of those unusual latency outliers. I'd recommend running exec snoop on your production systems. Find out what's happening. At Netflix, there's various other things that happen as well with debug using exec snoop. So maybe we've got EC2 rotate log problems where we're doing log rotation at certain times that's interfering with the application. And this shows up by running exec snoop, especially for those cron tab tasks that you added many years ago and you forgot about, you can then reveal by tracing it. It works by tracing the exec VE system call, which happens as a normal part of the fork exec routine when creating new processes. Now, here's a different tool. This is also for CPU analysis. It's RunQ latency. And this is showing a profile. RunQ latency, or scheduler latency, is the time your application spent waiting its turn on CPU. And this is all bad. Latency is a great thing for performance engineers to focus on, time waiting. Because if I eliminate the time waiting, things go faster. And so I want the run queue latency to be as close as possible to zero, zero microseconds. If it's high, it means things are waiting their turn. 
it can be high because there is more demand on a system than the CPUs can execute. So the CPUs are at 100% utilization, and there's still more workload demand. This shows up in the load averages, even though load averages contain uninterrupt uninterruptible tasks as well. But load averages aren't a great way to debug this in depth. This is a better way, as it shows how long things were waiting. There's this counterintuitive scenario that has shown up at Netflix and may show up for you as well, and that's where you have a system, and the CPU utilization may be low. It may be 20%. But there's a performance issue. Now, if you saw 20% CPU utilization, you may think, well, it's not going to be CPU related. So it must be disks or networking. I'll look somewhere, somewhere else. But no, it is CPU related. One problem, and there's many problems that can cause this, is that your monitoring system may be reporting CPU utilization as a one minute average. And during that one minute, you have a spike of CPU saturation for 10 seconds and then 50 seconds of idle. During that 10 seconds of saturation, there was so much CPU demand that applications were waiting their turn on CPU, and you can identify it with run queue latency. OK, so that example is pretty obvious. It's just a problem with averages. But there are examples that are less obvious. So one is with containers and C groups. So we're using containers at Netflix. C groups are the Linux technology to do resource controls, CPU and other resources. And there can be a situation where the host is at 20% CPU utilization, but one tenant, one container, is using its allotment of CPU and is being throttled. Again, if you look to the host, you might think, I don't have a CPU issue. But you do have a CPU issue. And it's not with the physical resource. It's with the software imposed limit. And that will show up in run queue latency. So that's pretty interesting. Another use case of run queue latency is if you have something strange, so some multiple NUMA system, and the kernel scheduler is not quite scheduling things accurate, accurately or, or efficiently. This can show up that as well. So that's a tool that we've used for a long, long time for discovering if we have scheduling bugs in the kernel. There's another tool. It's similar called RunQLen, which shows the RunQ length rather than la the latency. And I've just sold you on RunQ lat, which shows you the length of the time spent waiting, but I actually want you to deploy this in production. RunQ latency works by tracing scheduler events, and they can be really frequent. They could be 10 million times per second. BPF itself, and this is something as a performance engineer you, be, you become very good at understanding, and that's overhead. What is the overhead if I instrument something? With BPF, with a K-probe on a modern x86 system, the minimum overhead is about 70 nanoseconds for adding instrumentation to some event. Now, if I'm instrumenting exec snoop, if I'm instrumenting the exec system call to show new processes, I might be doing 100 new processes a second. If I'm adding 70 nanoseconds of CPU time, the total overhead is going to be negligible. Remember, we're on multi-CPU systems. So I might have 64 CPUs worth of capacity, and I'm adding 100 times 70 nanoseconds. I'm not even going to be able to measure it. But if I'm doing 10 million events a second, and I'm adding 70 nanoseconds of time, it can start to be measurable. With the BPF programs, they will do extra instructions. So a more realistic value would be 100 nanoseconds. And so you can do the calculations. And as a performance engineer, I, I have a sense of the frequency of operations. And then I can calculate what's the overhead if I go and instrument that. So run queue lad is something a little bit cautious about because I know that the scheduler events can be frequent. This can solve the same issue, but it does not trace schedule, scheduler events. So run queue len is another tool of mine. I am sampling the run queue length at 99 hertz, or 99 samples per second across all CPUs. Now, that gives me a deterministic frequency, 99, for each CPU. And so the overhead of this is negligible 
It doesn't matter how many scheduler events you have. The output is not, I would not call this a primary metric. Run-Q latency is a primary metric. This is how long you've spent waiting. Whereas this is a length, and you need to interpret it. I would call this a secondary metric. But it can solve the same issue and give you an insight into the same class of issues, but without the overhead. Now, I've talked about overhead a lot. I think Run-Q latency, the overhead of running that in production may be something like 1% or 2%. But at environments like Netflix, if we're running observability tools, we like the overhead to be 0.1% or less. So we put a lot of effort into, into minimizing that. Some other example tools. F faults shows file system faults, just as an example of memory introspection. Faults are a normal part of operation for a virtual machine, a, a mach machine that does memory allocation on demand. So a virtual memory machine. And that's where malloc lies and the kernel pretends that you, or the library pretends that you have the memory you've requested. And then when you actually start to access that memory, it, is it creates faults in the processor, and then the kernel has to map things together. And so this can be something we look for for performance analysis to understand what files are causing faults. There's just a new tool for doing that, F faults. BioLatency is an example of going at the storage I.O. level for disk analysis. And at the moment, if you look at a lot of performance monitoring solutions, they will show average I.O. latency over time. And average I.O. latency can hide multimodal distributions and latency outliers, and we really want to understand those. So BioLatency prints the distribution of disk I.O. latency. And the example I can see here, I've got a mode at 0 0.1 milliseconds, and then another mode from 8 milliseconds to 31 or 127. And so the, the I.O. latency can get quite high. That's much more interesting than the average, and this is typical. Disks have on-disk caches that re can return I.O. quickly. And if it misses the on-disk cache, it has to do the actual I.O., which is much slower. And so that skews the average. So you always want to see the distribution, especially for outliers as well. Now, that's great, but the kernel spends a lot of time avoiding slowing applications when they're accessing the disks. So for writes, it will use write-back caching. For reads, it will use read-ahead and a file system cache. And so I might use this tool and see, a, see these outliers and think, oh, wow, that looks terrible, 127 milliseconds. I'm sure that's killing an application. But in fact, that's just a, a file system flush event, where it's just flushed a lot of dirty pages to disk, and it's not slowed down the application. So while this is great for understanding what's happening at the disk level, the application can be separated from that on purpose by the kernel to improve application performance. And so I'd like to use the file system tools. I've developed many of these. XFS slower instruments at the file system level and shows what the file system exposed to the application. Here you can give it a threshold, 50 milliseconds. Here's all the file system I.O. that was slower than 50 milliseconds. This is a better indicator of application pain. Because if we're waiting, we really are waiting. And I use this tool to exonerate or prove storage I.O. subsystem issues. I've got versions of this for ext4, ButterFS, and ZFS as well. And not just for printing out each event. There's also versions that do this distribution as well. So here's XFS dist, and it has the distribution where I can see multimodal behavior for reads and writes and so on. Moving on to networking, TCP Life. TCP Life began as an idea by another systems engineer, Julia Evans. She asked on Twitter to have a tool that you could point to a port and show what was happening for that one port. And I thought, of course, that's a, we should have a, a BPF tool for doing this. I wrote TCP Life. And TCP Life has had a lot of adoption. This is this has been grown by the Netflix network engineering team to become our Flows R Us product, where we run this on all our systems so that, that we can understand which service is connecting to which other service. And I'm sure I'll see this used by many performance monitoring startups 
they'll take the output of this and then they'll turn it into a directed acyclic graph using graphviz so you can see which of your services are connecting to which other service. What's good about TCP Life is that it's efficient. I am not doing packet capture. I hate pa packet capture because packets can happen 10 million times a second. Netflix is running over 33% of the US internet traffic at night. I want to avoid packet capture. What this does is I instrument when the kernel changes the state of a TCP session. When you go from SYN sent to SYN received, SYN received to established, and established to closed. Those state changes only happen several times per TCP session when that TCP session could have done one million packets. So by instrumenting this low frequency state change, it can make the performance overhead of this negligible and satisfy the 0.1% overhead requirement. And so I get to get information like the millisecond column at the end shows the duration of sessions. The other two last columns show the transmit and receive kilobytes, which I'm plucking out of counters in the kernel, the TCP struct. And I've also got the IP information and the process information as well. And you don't get some of this information. I don't get process information if I'm doing packet capture anyway, because by the time you get down to the Y, you don't know which process was initiating it. And so it, the Netflix engineering team, they've added many more columns to get more information about each of these sessions. Anything in the kernel, we can add to this. And the kernel tracks a lot of things. As an example of another networking tool, TCP SYN BL from my book shows the SYN backlogs as histograms. If you've done network engineering where you create a socket and then you call listen on a socket, the listen call has a backlog argument. What should I set the backlog argument to be? The idea of this is you allow the kernel to buffer some inbound sessions, but not too many. If you buffer too many, you make yourself vulnerable to a SYN flood attack. Now, you know when you exceed the backlog because the packets will be dropped, the SYN packets will be dropped, and you have SYN-based retransmits. But how close is the application to this limit, and does it need to be tuned? And so now I've got the limits in use by the kernel and then a histogram to show how far away you are. I demonstrated fun count earlier with my IWL driver, another tool to explore systems. What functions are firing here? I'm looking at TCP underscore S star for all the TCP functions in the kernel. This is a great way to take open source software and then learn about it. How is it operating in production? Which things are firing? A lot of my examples are kernel-based, but we can go into applications as well. MySQL dslow is another tool I wrote to look at MySQL query strings and to show you the duration. And if you think about this, you might say, but MySQL already has the slow queries log for doing this. I don't need to run a BCC tool or BPF tool. And that's true, but an advantage of BPF is you have all the kernel information as well. So I might add extra columns, not just for the query string duration, but how much of that time was in network I.O. and disk I.O., faults, kernel locks, so that I have breakdowns that are not available at the application level that might help me diagnose issues more, more quickly. And there's lots of tools that give us observability into areas we didn't have before. Kernel work queue function execution times, I've got a tool for that, so I can see how long block MQ time at work, XFS end I.O., in case there's performance issues there. I can go into hypervisors. Now, previously, on Amazon EC2, we had para-virtualized guests, which, where the kernel is aware it's running it under a hypervisor and makes PV calls to the hypervisor, so I can instrument those. Nowadays, this tool is not so useful since we've switched to the Nitro hypervisor, which is much faster and uses direct metal access. So no longer do we need to do the PV calls so this tool doesn't actually do anything now in the modern systems, but the modern systems are faster, which is great. And also as an example for containers, all the C groups that throttle things and impose software limits. So I've got a tool for showing whether we were block IO throttled or not. That was a quick tour of only 14 tools out of over 150 that are all open source. I go through many in, in my book and we install them in the Netflix base AMI. And how we actually do that is we have a directory called apps, Netflix BPF all tools. 
And that puts all the BPF observability tools in a directory structure that makes sense. We don't want developers to have to learn that these disk tools come from BCC, and these ones come from BPF trace, and these ones come from here. We put all the disk tools into a disk subdirectory, and all the file system tools into a file system subdirectory. So if you want to do disk analysis, you just CD to disk, and they're all there in one place. And we open sourced this structure as well. So it's under Netflix Skunk Works. It's called the BPF Toolkit. But at Netflix, realistically, we have so many instances, people don't really want to be SSHing on in the first place. This is great as a last resort, but at Netflix, what's much more effective is to build self-service GUIs. And so we put GUIs for these tools, and we're building them. So now you can go from our Spinnaker tool to Perf Dash and Flame Commander and get BPF-based hist latency histograms and flame graphs just by clicking buttons. And we're doing more and more GUI work on top of these BPF tools. To give you a sense of how they're developed, the first thing I would tell you is only one engineer at your company needs to learn tool development. They can turn everyone else's ideas into tools. I don't necessarily want all Netflix engineers to learn how to code BPF tools. If some want to learn it, that's great, and, and various people do. But what's most important is that all Netflix engineers know it's a thing, it's possible, and then they can ask the performance engineering team for the BPF tools that they need. And that's going to be the same at other companies as well. You need to identify at least one person who can turn other people's ideas into tools. Other people need to know what's possible, and that's why I have these slides that give you a quick tour of what's possible. Firstly, to clear up some confusion, there are a lot of traces for Linux, but it's the BPF ones that have been the most successful as it's the in-kernel technology and it's seen that production deployment and use. BPF trace has the maturity of, I've now drawn is mature. It has we've stabilized the API. And then BCC is the other BPF trace one we're using a lot. As an example, here's a BCC tool for doing block IO histograms. And it's short enough that it fits on a slide, but still a little bit long. The advantage of BCC tools is that the program itself is Python, so that I can use other Python libraries. If I want to call gRPC or do some S3 things, there may be a Python li library for that, and I can use it as part of my tool. If I just want text-based output, BPF trace is great for that. And it has its own language that's awk-like, and it's very simple. Here's an equivalent one-liner in BPF trace, very simple. The structure of this has the probe instrumenting, an optional filter, and then the action when that event fires. And I, I ran one of these earlier at the command line for doing IWL debug, and I was doing a printf. Just to give you exposure of what's possible, there are many different event types. So this is all for the BPF trace language. Trace points, which are static, tr static events that are baked into the kernel code. There's, there's, there's an equivalent for user level code, kernel function tracing, user level function tracing, and so on. Software events, hardware events. We've added a new one that's not on this list for memory watch points. So they can go and run programs as BPF programs as well. Filters should be straightforward. I can match on, a, on this particular process or process name or whatever. When events fire, I can print things out if I want a log of events. I could do summaries, like histograms or counts. All of these are in the public BPF trace reference guide, but there's lots of functions. So linear histograms, min, max, average, statistics, and various other things we can do in those programs. To give you an idea of the variable types when you're writing programs, they're all built on this, these BPF maps, and they behave like associative arrays. And we can implement basic variables like global variables, thread local variables, and there are also scratch variables. There are many built-ins, like for returning the process ID, user ID, function name, stack traces, arguments to functions, and return values. Again, these are all in the reference guide. And so the end result for BPF traces, you can write these powerful one-liners. Files open by process, do the sys enter open trace point, and then printf the file name and the process name. 
read size distribution, do a histogram of the return value of the read system call. VFS calls, frequency count the function name for that K probe. VFS read length is histogram. It's a little bit long, but now I'm recording a timestamp on one event and then fetching it on the next event and doing the histogram. This is great for a performance engineer as I can do these custom latency measurements from one point to another. And of course, we can go into user space as well. To see how that fits together, this is a BPF trace program, bio, bio latency, that shows the histogram of disk latency. And the entire program fits on a slide, which is great. So I record a timestamp when the block account IO start, K probe fires, and then when it when this other K probe kernel function fires, I check if that timestamp's been recorded, and then I can do a histogram. At Netflix, it's great that we can do this if need be, need be, but we want the GUIs. We want to be able to have push buttons for engineers to get summaries and reports. And so here's BioLancy as a GUI. This is in Netflix Vector. And it's showing it as a latency histogram. A latency, sorry, a latency heat map. This is a visualization I created many years ago. This is the old GUI. We've now recently switched to Grafana, so it now looks like this. And so I can see the multimodal distributions and outliers, and I can see the pattern change over time. And in the future, we're building more and more of these GUIs on top of the BPF tools to make it easy for everyone at Netflix to run. And as with the tools, I expect we will be often open sourcing many of these as well. Some takeaways. Add BCC and BPF trace packages to your servers. They, those are the main front ends for BPF observability. And you can start using these BPF performance tools directly, or you can build GUIs on top of them, like we're doing. And of course, identify one or more engineers at your company who's going to be responsible for BPF. And everyone else needs to understand what's possible, and they can ask that one person for ideas. And that's my talk. Thank you very much. And I've got some references here. <laughs>